All right. Good evening, everybody. Hope everyone's doing well tonight. Um, if you want to turn with me to John chapter 17, we'll be there for a little bit. As we look at a very, very important thing that Jesus says regarding unity. And that's, that's what our, our topic is for tonight. It's, it's the reality of Christian unity. And sort of like what it is and what it looks like. And then some challenges that can come up when we try to do that. Because uh, unity, uh, I mean, if you look at our world, especially in the last like week, <laughs> unity is, is not always very easy to accomplish. Uh, even in a nation where everybody has about the same level of education, same culture, same language, uh, a lot of things in common. Unity is still very difficult. All right, so John chapter 17, starting in verse 9. Here Jesus is uh, giving his high priestly prayer, uh, getting down towards the end of his life. Uh, here before, uh, before he's, uh, before he's uh, tried and executed. He says, I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you've given me, for they're yours. All mine are yours, all yours are mine, and I'm glorified in them. For I am, I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you've given me, that they may be one even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I've guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled." But now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may, be, they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I've given them your word, and, your word is ha- and, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you've sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world." And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they may also be sanctified in truth. You know, when somebody's going through a hard time, going through some kind of difficulty, especially if it's something that they might not make it out of, you know, health concerns, some kind of um, catastrophic event, it tends to clarify things, right? It tends to, to, to help you put your priorities in the proper order. Uh, Because normally I think we can be kind of lazy about things, and we have the luxury of having a lot of time to do things. And when you have that kind of luxury, you know, sometimes we're we're a little bit wasteful. But when you know your time is short, you know that that luxury's run out. And there are certain things that you need to do (laughs) and get it done pretty quickly uh, before before that happens. So it's kind of like when I'm on campus, uh, you know, day in and day out uh, at Faulkner, I uh, uh, interact with you know, students every day, and you know we really enjoy that. But I'm always thinking about what I was doing when I was in their shoes. Of course, this has been a a little while ago, um, and uh, and so I think back, and man, I was a ding dong when I was in college. That's just, that's, I mean, I mean, maybe some people think I still am. It's possible. Um, but in, in college, it's like, you know, you have, so, or, or when, I, when I was in college, I wasn't terribly mature, right? That's, that's, I guess that's going to be kind of obvious when I say what I'm about to say. Um, but when I, when I was in, in college, uh, it's like, you know, I had so much time on my hands. It's like, it was a, it was a challenge to me to find out ways to waste it. Um, just, you know, what, what do you do? Well, I got up and played video games for like six hours this morning, and then we went to hung out at McDonald's. We were going to go to Chuck E. Cheese because, you know, those have the good arcade games, or they used to, and we tried to get into the ball pit, and, you know, they kind of chased us out, and then, uh, you know, maybe we went down to, uh, down to Nashville, downtown, and went to Tower Records because they had a big store down there on 21st Avenue, and, you know, we wasted a bunch of time. It's only 3 o'clock in the afternoon now. I've still got 12 hours before bedtime, you know, and that's kind of how, like, <laughs> like days went sometimes uh, when that, uh, uh, when I was in college, and so... Uh, you know, we just do random things. You know, if, if you live in East Tennessee, you know, or, or have been through East Tennessee, you know that there's all these signs that say Sea Rock City. So we did, you know. One day, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. What are you doing? Nothing. You want to go Sea Rock City? Sure. So we go take off and, and go, 
you know, look at this, uh, you know, kind of like tourist trap that has these weird rock formations with these little mountain gnomes that are hidden everywhere. Right? So it's, you know, that's, that's what we did. We just had all this time uh, to waste. And, and if I could, and, and sometimes I'll try to drop like these nuggets of truth for, for, for my students. And, uh, and I, I don't know if I'm doing a good job or I don't know if they, you know, if all of them appreciate it. But you know, all the things that, that I, I did that I, I, I wish I hadn't done, it's kind of like, I, I kind of like drop little hints you know, for them not to do those things too. And, and one of those is wasting time. And so um, when, uh, uh, if, if I were able to go back, you know, and talk to my 18-year-old old self, I would say, you know, just, just devote half of the time that you spend playing video games to doing something productive. I guarantee you, you will be like president of the world if, you know, if, if you could just do that, you know, and, and so, um, so, we, so we have those things where we have this luxury of time and it, uh, you know, we, we let it just sort of get away, away from us. And there's sometimes there are things that kind of bring it in the fo- back into focus, right? So this, this past year I had, I think it was five different people that I know all had heart problems. And so there were, all of them but one was around my age, within, within a year and a half of, of, of my age. And uh, one was my brother-in-law. He was in the middle of having a heart attack. When they took him to the hospital, they were able to, you know, put some stents in and kind of took care of him. I had a good friend, oldest friend that I've got. He uh, uh, was going. He, he was on that on that road. All of his, you know, arteries were not over ninety percent blocked. All of them. And you know, they 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 were going to do a quadruple bypass. They got in there and they're like, "Well, no, you're going to need one more." And uh, I thought that was unusual because that seems like something you need a little bit more planning for than just to kind of throw it in there at the last minute. And I don't know if it's like kids. You know, you have a certain number of kids and like, you have one more. It's just, you know, it's another one. You know, it's, it's around here somewhere, you know. Um, but uh, so, so, so that, that, was, that was, you know, kind of jarring to me because he's just a little bit older than I am. And then his daughter, who's a student at Faulkner, she's going to be a sophomore this year. She had heart problems. She had to come out for about a week. And then uh, a friend of mine um, that I had met at PTP for the first time. We'd known each other for a while, met each other for the very first time, hit it off really great, um, just a really super guy. And uh, we go home, and about five months later, you know, I get a note from his wife on Facebook, and he's died. And so in moments like that, it kind of brings you into this sort of understanding of, of how short your time is. And I think that's where Jesus is in this, in this passage. Um, I could only, you know, imagine what it was like to, to be Jesus who, who can't you know, forget anything. I mean, you know, his, his, his knowledge is not like ours, right? He, he, um, he just simply... Uh, could understand events, and and I don't think I don't think he forgot things. Um, you know, when, if I have to go to the doctor, it's like I try to you know put that off and and not look at my calendar because I'm dreading that the whole time, and that's not something that would have applied to him. So 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 his whole life, he knows how it's going to end. The, he, he gets down to the last week, he knows how it's going to end. He, we're down at the last day, the last 24 hours, and he knows exactly what's going to happen. And so when you are in a position like this, you know that your time is precious. And every word you speak is more valuable than the last one. And so the thing that Jesus chooses to pray about, to talk about in this moment, is, among other things, the unity of his people, uh, of of his guys. And so uh, he wants them to be uh, together wants them to be unified, just like Jesus and the Father uh, are one, right? So, if you want to flip over to Ephesians chapter four, uh, we're going to spend just a little bit of time there as well. And what I'd like to do is sort of look at what this has to tell us about that, because um, being unified does. Uh, there's a lot of different aspects of it uh, to it. We only have time to maybe you know, do just a little bit here. But Jesus says, I want them to be one. I want them to be sanctified in the truth. So I want to kind of pull that out and and touch on that uh, just for the next few minutes. Um, And so in Ephesians 4, 
Of course, those of you who know, know your Bible really well know this is the section with the seven ones, right? And so Ephesians 4, starting in verse 1, says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one, one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There's one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So when, Peter, uh, when Paul is talking about him urging the Ephesians to walk in a manner worthy, uh, he is using a term that would be used for the system of, of benefaction in the, in the ancient world. So what would happen is you'd have maybe like a benefactor, right? So let's say you're an artist, you're a writer, you're somebody important. You'd have a benefactor who would give you money, and this this happened all the way up through you know, like, like medieval Europe too, right? So this this is this is not just an ancient thing. This this happened all the way up, and it's, I mean I guess occasionally happens today still. But you have somebody who's really talented, and instead of them you know just being able to do this part time or, or as time permits, uh, you have a benefactor who will pay that person, give kind of pay for their living expenses, pay for their their upkeep, and so they can go and use this, you know, exceptional talent and really explore that and, and use that for the greater good. And the language that Paul uses here plays on that a little bit because when you gave a gift, when you were a benefactor to someone, it required a response from that person. And so, you know, you, you give a great gift. And, and the word that, that's used here of the gift that people give is actually the same word, um, the Greek word for grace in the New Testament. That's not a coincidence, right? And so when Paul says, I urge you to walk in a worthy manner, he's saying, you've been given an incredible gift. You've been given grace. And so there are certain obligations, there are certain responsibilities that you now have on your end to show your thankfulness and your appreciation for what you've been given, right? And so this is, this is the kind of language that he's using it here. Um, and so this was not just, oh, give me a gift. Oh, how sweet, you're nice, you know, and then you <laughs> just kind of go on. This was, there was a response that was expected, right? There was, there was an obligation that you now had to that person because of the gift that they had given you. So what Paul says here is we've got this, marvelous gift. Okay, so, so the language, he doesn't, uh, I don't think he says grace in this passage, but that is what is sort of behind it uh, in the language that he's using. And so, so what do you do? What, what, what does a response of faith look like if, if, we're, um, if we're Christians? Uh, well, first of all, he says walk in a worthy manner. That's verse 1. Okay, um, But then he says, there are some characteristics that you should have. And of course, this sort of reminds us of the uh, fruit of the Spirit. It reminds us of the Beatitudes. But humility, gentleness, and patience, verse 2. And then he also says, bearing with one another in love, kind of combining you know, forbearance and love together in that one, in that one phrase. And so here's how you demonstrate that. right? If you're a believer, if you're, a, you're one of Jesus' people, this is uh, a very short list of some things you should consider demonstrating in your life. Humility, gentleness, patience, loving each other. Now, the thing is, all of this, uh, you look at verse 3, and there's an eagerness to maintain unity. Right? It's not just, you know, uh, a bunch of people who get together and then we just all have similar interests or do just church stuff together. There is an interest in having unity with each other. And these you know, four qualities are how we sort of do that. Uh, I mean, among others. And so it's something that's not accidental. right? It is something that is absolutely intentional. We work for that. That's what it is. Uh, it, 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 is, it is the consequence of how we live that we're going to be together in unity. Now, 
these aren't always qualities that people have in natural abundance. Um, for me, this is especially true on the road when I'm driving. Uh, these qualities, I have to be very careful or they go out the window. Um, but uh, for a lot of folks, right, this is something that, uh, and, and, and our world has a way of putting challenges, you know, up, up in the face of all of these things, humility, gentleness, patience, you know, these kinds of things aren't always prized in our world. They are prized in the church. And that's you know, one of many things that makes the church very different than the world. But you think about the community that we have as Christians. Okay? You want to talk about a church. Imagine a church where every single one of us makes it a passion. We make it a driving goal to be humble, to be gentle, to be patient, to, all, to be as loving as we can toward each other, as understanding as we can toward each other. What an absolutely marvelous place to be. <sighs> right? What a wonderful, wonderful community to be a part of, right? And so when we, uh, when we think about that, we say, oh, this is almost like, this is like as close as, to a utopia as you can get on earth. Um, now contrast that with the world, which definitely is sort of the opposite of this. And if you want to find a really good place to find the total contrast to what Paul is getting at here, just social media. I mean, that, I, mean like, I don't even have to explain it. Just that. Go do it, right? That's, that's, it's, that's what it is. And um, especially if you go to a, maybe a post where it's a little bit controversial or somebody's offering uh, maybe like an unpopular opinion, just go look in the comment section. And the way I've sort of described it, it's like if you had a, an aquarium, a huge aquarium full of piranha, and World War II, and they had a baby. That's the comment section on a lot of posts in social media. And, you know, it's like, well, that sounds extreme, Dwayne. Um, go, go check that out for me, right? It'll take you maybe five, ten seconds, and then you'll be like, oh, there it is. I, I see it, right? Uh, so that's, that's our world, though. That's what our world looks like, and that's the kind of thing that our world likes. It likes stoking um, tensions, it likes outrage, it likes getting people upset and angry, and there are some who sort of wait on pins and needles, just waiting for the next time that they can get upset about something, uh, waiting for the next time they can go burn down a building or rob a dollar general, and how refreshing it is to get to come to a place like this where you ideally have everyone wanting to be humble and to be gentle and to be patient and to be loving. What a great place to be. What a refreshing oasis uh, in the world a place like, like church is. And we get to do this every, every week. We get to go to the best place on earth and be around people trying to be the best people on earth multiple times every week. Well, what does, what does this unity in, in, in truth look like? And I, I want to pull out just a few things here. Um, one is uh, going through the seven ones. Okay? So, so one is one body, right? And that's something that absolutely, I mean, all of them speak to today, but this one absolutely does. In the ancient world that Paul lived in, I mean, you had Jew and Gentile, and those are pretty separate Right? And we know a little something about, you know, the divisions, the sometimes very deep and sometimes wounded divisions uh, between ethnicities. And so I think we can sort of sympathize a little bit uh, with Paul's world. And we look at our world and everything is divide and conquer for some reason. You know, our politicians, political parties, social media, all of it does that. And sometimes if we're not careful, if we're not being watchful, Right? It, can, it, it can infiltrate the church, and we have to be very vigilant that we don't let those attitudes not only creep into the body of Christ, but creep into us, right? because that's kind of where it starts. And so Paul will say, renew your mind, right? Renew your mind. And when he says that, it's like, okay, there's, there's something that needs to change, right? If we're in the world, not of the world, um, then there's a change that's taken place. 
that somehow makes us different. We're, we're still, we still have to be here, right? We still have to live here. But there's something that's different. There, 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 there's, a, there's a change that's taken place that somehow it's like we're, we're here, but we know this isn't home. This, is not where, this, this may be where we come from. This is not where we're staying, right? And so, uh, so this is, is uh, something that Paul will talk about. Uh, he, mean, he talks about one spirit, uh, one hope, one Lord. Uh, one thing uh, that you'll find today is you sort of have like this custom fit religion, right? You'll have, uh, so I did a video on my YouTube channel on a, a fellow one, uh, that is a progressive Christian. He, he, this is, uh, sometimes in the churches of Christ, when you use the word progressive, we mean sort of like liberal. It's almost kind of like synonymous. I mean somebody who's like out on the fringe uh, was this fellow, and he said, I choose to interpret Jesus with my own cultural symbols. And even if I get it wrong, it's still my Jesus. And I, and I wanted to say, you know, your Jesus, Jesus doesn't belong to you. Right? you. You don't get to define who Jesus is. He does. And, uh, and, and so, but, but, but we see this today. We, we, we see this kind of phenomenon where we sort of, we want to get our hands in. And we want to kind of tinker with things. And we, we want to shape and manipulate things. And we say, well, it's, it's, my, it's my Christianity. It's my Jesus. It's my God. Well, that's all, those things have already been defined. And they don't need any input from us. Right? They're already, already defined for us. Um, so we'll talk about uh, one, uh, one, bapt- well, one faith, uh, one baptism uh, here. And... For the early church, you know, again, this was this was very specific. This is something that they did, and uh, even in the way that in some places they baptized people, it's like you were when, when you did when you were baptized, you were turning your back on the world. So uh, I may have mentioned this before. If I have, I apologize. But the way that some people would 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 do baptism a little bit differently than the, than the more simplified way we do, right? It's very very simple response: you know, baptism for the remission of sins. They would have a, a sort of a, a ceremony, a sort of a physical action that they would that they would do, and they would they would turn one one particular direction, and the position of the body was important. It is it, almost like it mirrored your spiritual disposition, right? And so you, so so you, you turn one way, and you say, "I renounce the world with all of its celebrations and all of its this and that's the other thing." So all this stuff. And so it, it, it kind of tells you just the, just the position of the body. It's like this, this is how we all are before we come to Christ, before we're, before we're added to the church. Right? Because if the world is this way and Christ is that way, because they would turn around and say, I, I embrace you, O oh Christ, and, I, and I, I devote my life to you, and then they would be baptized. It's kind of like that tells you everything. In a, in, a, in, a, in a very simple 180 degree turn about what a person does spiritually when they become a Christian. So I'm looking at the world. My, I've, I've got my back to Jesus, right? Which matches what Paul says about, you know, before, um, before we are, I mean, we're enemies of God, right? And so we turn around and it's like we're turning our back on the world. And that one change of posture tells you everything about what we do spiritually, um, we, uh, you know, we turn absolutely turn our back on the world. James will say, uh, "Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God?" You don't get to say, "Well, I want some of this over here, and I want some of this over here," and then try to ride that fence. Right? That's not uh, that is that is not how it works. Um, you have to turn your back on one of them. Right? So the question is, which one is it? You going to keep your back turned to God, or are you going to turn your back on the world? Um, that's the question. And then the last thing that, that's mentioned here is one God and Father of all. And that gives us uh, kind of an image of the unity of believers in the, 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 the picture of the family. And in the, in the New Testament, we'll do a lot of these things, right? So like a spiritual house made of living stones, a flock of sheep, a vine with branches, um, uh, all, you know, one body, many parts, you know, lots, of, lots of images like that. And so the thing is, though, you don't lose your individuality, 
right, when you become a Christian. I, I think some people are worried about that. Oh, I'm just going to become a cookie cutter, right? I'm just going to be like, like everybody else. Uh, no, individuality, I think, is celebrated. But so is being one, part of that one body of Christ, right? That's, that's extraordinarily important. Now, what we see with unity and why it's important, um, I think, is because it's different than a lot of other world religions, so when you look at world religions all across the board, even if you look at denominations within Christendom, it is absolutely natural for people to want to break off and, and do branches and do kind of separatist groups and do something where they sort of steer the course of their own little religious community. And so uh, you could look at any of, the, any of the major world religions. I mean, you look at Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, Christendom. When I say Christendom, I mean everything that claims to be Christian, right? I mean, you've got all kinds of, this is like trees. They've got all kinds of branches going everywhere. That is, I think, not the design that you see in the New Testament. There is one church, and that church is to be unified, right? And so there are things that we do. Some, sometimes it's personally. Right in the attitudes and behaviors that we have, sometimes it's doctrinally. Uh, so, what do you believe? Is do you believe that Jesus really is the Son of God? Do you really believe that He did die for your sins? Do you really do believe that you need to be baptized? These are all very, very important things. Right. So, so we have a way of of kind of splitting off and doing all kinds of stuff, uh, religiously speaking. But what Christianity does is it actually kind of does the opposite. It's, it takes like people and kind of brings them together. Because when you look in the early church, the early church was multi-ethnic, multicultural. It was designed for both sexes, all ages, every socioeconomic level. It didn't matter who you are or where you came from. There was a place for you in church. That seems to be the opposite of what a lot of religious groups did in the time of Jesus, where you'd have some that were gender specific. There were several religions just for men. Uh, there were some, they, uh, a whole number of religions that catered toward the wealthy. Uh, you really had to be wealthy because you had to pay initiation fees. Now, that sounds kind of weird, but yes. Um, so you have all these kinds of things that wind up splitting uh, people apart from each other and dividing people, and the Bible actually downplays the things that other religions and um, lots of worldviews highlight. So, you know, um, your, your skin color, it doesn't matter. The Bible's very clear about that. Your gender, I mean, men and women have different roles, of course, but uh, as far as our worth, our standing before God, that's exactly the same. There's, there's no, there's no um, privileging one over the other. You know, different cultures, different languages. You know, none, none of this, these are all secondary things. None of these things matter. What matters is can you say with the Apostle Paul, it is no longer I but Christ who lives in me? That's what's important, right? And then the things that kind of flow out of that. Now, um, there's one, uh, one story that I want to I touch on very quickly uh, as we sort of uh, get, get close to, to wrapping things up here. It's by a writer named Flannery O'Connor. And she was a, uh, a writer. She was born in Savannah, Georgia, 1925. And she was a Southern writer who often wrote about eccentric characters or flawed characters. Um, she was Roman Catholic. A lot of you know, biblical themes are in her, her stories. She mostly wrote short stories. Um, unfortunately, she died from lupus at the age of 39. And one of the last things she ever wrote was a short story called Revelation. And uh, you know, she wrote it uh, while she was dying in the hospital. And it's a story that centers on a woman named Ruby Turpin. And she had lots of religious themes in it. Uh, but she and her husband live in the South. And they have African-American workers who work for them. She isn't very wealthy, but she prides herself on being a hard worker. Because rich people have it easy. Right? They just have so much money they don't have to really do anything. She's a hard worker. right? And so, as you can probably tell, pride is one of her, one of her big problems. 
Uh, she, thinks that she thinks that she's better than everybody. And the only people that she treats with respect are people just like her. And so she uh, bosses her husband around. She thanks Jesus for her blessings and for not making her, and this is the language of the story, black or white trash. Uh, and she looks down with condescension at virtually everybody. Now, one day, and the story takes place in a doctor's office, most of it, about you know, two-thirds of it. And it's in a doctor's office, and she's there with her husband. Something's happened. He's got something, some problem with his leg. And there's other people in the, in the waiting room. And, you know, most of the, of the dialogue is kind of in her mind. It's, it's kind of, you know, while well, di- this room is too small, why didn't they make it bigger? This person over here, they, you know, what's wrong with them? This girl over here, she looks like there's something wrong with her. You know, it, it's, it's all this, you know, just nitpicking everybody. And um, except for this one lady, right, that's, that's dressed just like her and talks just like her and sort of presumably judges people just like her. And, uh, and so she talks with this lady a lot. But, but as they're talking, it, there's, this, there's this girl. She gets really irritated. Um, and finally, she winds up throwing a book at the lady, and, and, and Miss, Mrs. Turpin, and hits her in the face. And, you know, after everything calms down, the little girl said, the, the, the girl, I guess she's maybe like late teenager, the girl says, go back to hell where you came from, you old warthog. And that gets her goat. And she spends the rest of the day mad about what this girl told her. Uh, not only to, because of to tell her where to go, but what she compared her to, because she raises hogs, right? She doesn't see that she's anything like them. And so she goes home, and everything from that point on, and maybe you've been in this position before, everything that happens that isn't completely agreeable to you makes you mad. But everything, for, everything gets under your skin. Well, that's her, right? So everything. So she goes in and she talks to her African American workers, and they're like, "Oh, oh, ma'am, you know, why would anybody ever do anything like that to you? You're just the sweetest thing." And what they're doing is they're kind of making fun of her because they know that she thinks she's better than them, and so they're kind of mocking her a little bit. Well, that makes her even madder, right? Oh, no, that girl just needs a whooping. I'll join in. We, we all need to go do it, right? And so, so they're mocking her. They're making fun of her. And, um, well, that makes her mad. And finally, she gets down to the very end uh, of the story, and she, she's rinsing this thing off where she has these hogs. And she's praying, and she's praying angry. I don't know if you have any experience with that. But, uh, but she's praying angry, and she finally, uh, you know, she, she, she's saying, you know, to God, you know, you know I'm, I'm, I'm not one of those people, right? Fill in the blank with all the other, I guess if you want to use the word deplorables that are in her life. I'm not like any of them. I'm better than all of them. And at the very end of the prayer, she says to God, who do you think you are? Well, then Mrs. Turpin has a vision, Right? Almost like, like the prophet Jeremiah, right? or, or like Isaiah, one of the other prophets. See, she's rinsing these hogs off, and she has this vision that kind of opens up in front of her. And she sees all these people going to heaven, all this, 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 this number of different souls, all of whom are going to heaven. And she sees the first group. She sees all these, what she calls white trash, well, that's irritating, right? And then she sees all the black people in white robes. And then she sees um, battalions of freaks and lunatics shouting and clapping and leaping like frogs. And then she finally sees the people that are like her, and they're at the dead end of the line. And she is very surprised in, in the vision that she has all the people, they're surprised themselves. They, they, they can't believe that they're at the end of the line. Why aren't they at the first? They're, after all, they're better than everyone else. And so, um, so she sees this. And what, um, what O'Connor says is you could see by their shocked and altered faces that even their virtues were being burned away. And this is the last thing that I want to hit on because 
This, I think, is one of the most insidious problems that can affect anyone in church if we're not careful. And that is that we tend to look at people and, you know, uh, Mrs. Turpin likes to put people into groups, right? And of course, she, she's better than everyone else. So she goes to the front of the line. Well, we, we sometimes put people in groups. And the thing is, when we make those groups, like, like maybe like church groups, like, like people who are good, godly people, Christian people, if you do something that's wrong, that's like a sin, well, it sort of, it sort of gets you in trouble. Right? It, sort, it sort of maybe puts you on the outs or puts you on the bubble. It, it's, it's a vice, you know, is it, not acceptable. It sort of disqualifies them. But the thing is, one of the most dangerous problems to avoid can sometimes be the good things that we do. Because what we've done is we've done them in pride, or we've made an idol out of them. And that is exactly what Ruby Turpin does. She makes, uh, uh, she's incredibly arrogant, incredibly prideful, and every good thing that she does is born out of that pride and is therefore tainted by her arrogance. Now, uh, again, uh, you know, uh, when we look at uh, all the things that separate us, the world is going to try to get us to separate ourselves from each other, right? And it's something we have to watch out for as Christians, that we don't allow, you know, let ourselves kind of get, get caught up in that. Um, you know, all, this, all the stuff, that secondary things that I mentioned a minute ago, I mean, none of that matters. The Bible says it doesn't matter. Um, sin and moral failures. We sometimes use those to judge others, but the Bible is very clear. Everyone is in that boat before we come to Christ. Everyone is in that boat before we're added to the church. We're all enemies uh, of God. And so we're all, we all need God's grace. But the most insidious thing that the world does to separate us is to appeal to our pride and get us not to think of others as being worth less, but to think of ourselves as being worth too much. Now, that might, be, uh, might not be the most popular way to divide the body of Christ, but it is certainly one of the most deceptive. Now, uh, there's no doubt that the, um, the Bible emphasizes the unity of believers, and that is unbelievably important. There is a blessedness to getting to be part of a spiritual family, and it all starts with unity. It means um, a, a different kind of unity, and that means being reconciled to God first, right? So um, if there's anyone here tonight, I'm just going to go and offer the invitation. If there's anyone here tonight who is not part of the body of Christ, this is your opportunity to do that. This is, this is your opportunity to be able to come forward and uh, with all of us, I'm sure, cheering you on uh, to take that last step uh, that you need to take to become a Christian, uh, there may be somebody who's done that before, but, you know, something, you let that get in between you and God, and now you need to give whatever that, that thing is, give it up, and come back to him. Um, I do want to say, though, that in a gathering like this, and I, I say this as an introvert, so I feel your pain, um, if, if you are you know, a little wary of, of doing something publicly, uh, find somebody privately, um, we have incredible elders, great deacons, uh, lots of folks here that will be able to help you if you want to respond in a less public way, right? And, uh, and if you just need to ask for the prayers of the congregation, we'd love to pray with you and for you. Uh, but whatever you need, please let us know while we stand and sing.